Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Professor David Tizard and welcome to lecture number six in this course on modern Korea. Today we're going to be talking about economic inequality. Now, there's a list of materials on the website that I would like you to go through as much as possible. I'm going to take a different path in this lecture so that the reading materials in the lecture aren't always just the same thing. This should be giving you a different dimension so that you get value from watching the lecture. And I can also then see that you've spent some time trying to understand perhaps some of the ideas in this. Now, as we've done previously with other topics, what I'm going to do in this is try to challenge your ideas or challenge your preconceived notions of what you might think about economic equality or capitalism, those things. So when we did suicide last week, which is sure a big problem in South Korea, I also looked at the ideas that well, maybe suicide is freedom. Maybe suicide is the last act of the individual. We looked at Albert Camus and Dostoevsky to try to get some different perspectives on it. I'll be doing that again today, hopefully trying to challenge your understandings, not because it's what I necessarily believe, but rather to give you different perspectives that you might not have heard of before. You can see on the screen, we start with this picture of the award winning director Bong Joon-ho and his films really do cover a lot of economic equality. They go through a lot of that. You'll see it in Okja where you have the rural South Korean family living happily with the land, with nature and with the big fat pig. And then you see the corruption in the West of the economy and people valuing that over health or life. It's very prevalent in that. In Snowpiercer, the movie that Bong Joon-ho made, again, you see this economic equality between those at the back, the many, and the one, the individual at the front of the train. And that whole journey from right to left is getting up to the front of the train, trying to overturn the system. The train can be a, a symbol of capitalism, as it were. And finally, in Parasite, in Giseng Chung, Again, you have the, instead of horizontal direction through the social and economic classes, in that movie you have a vertical symbolic direction with the haves, the rich, the yangban at the top and the journey downwards into the lower class where they have not and they're, they're struggling economically. So Bong Joon-ho does look at a lot of these ideas in all of his movies. It seems to be a very common thread and he's always looking at the relationship between the upper and the lower class economically. What is the difference between them? And, and that's what we're kind of getting into today. This quote from Bong Joon-ho uh, is all over the internet at the moment, so I thought I'd start with that, in which he says, I tried to express a sentiment specific to the Korean culture. All the responses from different audiences were pretty much the same. Essentially, we all live in the same country called capitalism. We all live in very different countries and you can see that at the moment from the COVID-19 or the coronavirus uh, pandemic in that many countries are responding differently. South Korea and the United States, they're going through very different experiences at the moment. South Korea has had um, <clears throat> national elections. South Korea hasn't imposed any laws telling people to stay home. They're just guidelines. South Korea is looking at giving lots of money to people. <clears throat> Excuse me. Obviously, not just Lee Jae Myung in Gyeonggi trying to give Shimanwon to all the Koreans, but beyond that, even my family received money for our two children because they're under seven. Uh, we got Saship and Saship for Edward and Elizabeth, and there's no hoarding. The the stores are still full. If you compare that with America, situation is very different. So while uh, Bong Joon-ho says we all live in the same country called capitalism. You might suggest that while the economic the economic structure is the same, capitalism exists in both countries or in many countries around the world. The cultures. By the cultures, we mean the people. Sorry for writing on your face. 
Mr. Bong. The cultures, the people are different. There are different values here, aren't there? There are different values between uh, Korea and America. Of course, they all value free speech and, and democracy and those things. But I don't think it's a very extravagant or extreme remark to say Korean culture and American culture are a little bit different because they are. And you notice that when you just go out and you go on the subway and you go to a restaurant and you go to the cinema and you date someone and you meet family. The cultures are different. They're noticeably different. And that's why, for example, many young South Koreans want to go to America because they want a different culture, because they feel alienation here in South Korea. They feel this kind of tal joson or hel joson feeling and, and, and they desire to be somewhere else and to be someone. So economic structures are the same, but I believe the cultures are slightly different and that might explain uh, quite a bit of what's going on. Capitalism versus communism. One final cartoon. Capitalism. Everybody stands in line to get the latest Apple iPhone. In communism. Everybody stands in line just to get some bread. Of course, there's a lot of truth in that. But again, what you're seeing at the moment is millions of Americans standing in line to get food from the American government. So it's interesting to look at capitalism and communism or socialism more accurately, I think, through a long term perspective, because these economic systems, they should be designed for longevity. They shouldn't just be designed for 20 or 30 years prosperity. We want to try to find systems that are designed for 200, 300, 400, 500 years of prosperity, if possible, because we will have children or we do have children or our parents. We need things to last across generations. It's not useful to create systems that just create wealth in our own lifetimes because our life is very temporary and our life will not really be that long. We need to find ones that will secure the future for the coming generations because otherwise then there will be big problems. There could be a sort of war it's well known. It's not well known, but it's quite often suggested that it is Great Depression that can lead to conflict, that can lead to war. When there is money, when there's trade things happening, then war is often a bit less. But when there is no economic movement, when there is a depression, and we saw that in the 1930s, and then what happened after that was the Second World War, then we do get uh, periods of intense fighting. So Capitalism has been great, and it was great, and in some countries it is still great, in that it's lifted people out of poverty, greater education, nobody's really going hungry anymore in general, the stores are full, but how long does it last? And this is what we're going to look at today. Is it a model that eats itself? Is it a model that it, cannot, it can work for a short time, but the longer you run the system, the longer you run the model, does it eventually, like the snake eating its own tail, does it eventually devour itself? The thing that causes its success is also the thing that causes its ruin, if that makes sense to you. That's quite a complex idea for young minds sometimes, but the thing that gives success is also the very same thing that causes the destruction of it. Um, just to try to unpack a couple of these isms. So isms are really important in, in your university study. You need to know what isms are and how they're used. And also know that socialism can mean different things to different people. For example, uh, Bernie Sanders, the American presidential candidate, would classify himself as a social democrat, um, democratic socialist in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, we have Communist Party and Socialist Party. We have free health care. So there are elements of that all around Europe. In South Korea, excuse me, these terms are very controversial. And that's why I, I think it's worth covering them because they are a modern issue and you need to try to understand them because you might not have come across them before. You might just be have avoided them. For example, when I was doing Soksa or Baksa at Sejong Dahakyo, Hanyang Dahakyo, uh, many Korean professors, if we were looking through a book or a textbook, for example, and there would be elements of first uh, 
Thomas Hobbes and then Adam Smith. When we got to Karl Marx, the Korean professors would just skip him or they would skip the sections on Marxism or communism because they couldn't approach that topic. It was very difficult and dangerous. And to some extent, it still is in South Korea. But I like dangerous ideas. So let's do some dangerous ideas. It's not really that dangerous in, in, in the global scale. The difference between socialism and communism. Well, what do they share in common? What are the common features? You can see them in the middle, that they're both a form of political and economic theory, certainly in terms of economic. So you wouldn't really compare communism and democracy. That's a bit strange because democracy is purely a political theory and capitalism is the economic theory. Of course, economic, of course, democracy does have some economic uh, aspects to it and capitalism does have some political aspects to it. But in general, democracy is a political theory and capitalism is an economic theory. And so to say that we're democratic and they're communist is comparing essentially sometimes a political and economic theories, which doesn't quite line up. It doesn't quite make sense. It should m more be capitalism versus communism. So instead of saying we are the sort of minjujui dang or we are the we are the democratic Korea and you're the communist Korea, it should be more like we are the capitalist Korea, not the democratic one. And of course, as you probably know, uh, North Korea calls itself the DPRK. That's the official name uh, translated into English, which is the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. They call themselves democratic. And, yeah. for example, in China here, this communism is the CCP in China, which is the Chinese Communist Party. Now, the Chinese Communist Party is very much a political thing because a lot of the economy is based on capitalism now. So in China, for example, the economy a lot of it is run on capitalism. But the politics is still on that single party and no democratic votes. You don't go and vote for Xi Jinping. The people vote, uh, the, the lawmakers or the Chinese Communist Party choose themselves. They don't give the people the chance to vote for the leaders. So it's not democratic politically. It's communist essentially in terms of politics, but in terms of economy, for the most part, it's capitalist. So you try to draw apart politics and economy if you can. Uh, both oppose capitalism. Both are focused on equality. This is a key word for um, these two. You have these two uh, uh, convergent or different ideas. Equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. Now, this one is the capitalist idea and this one is the communist idea. Equality of opportunity. Everybody has the same chance. Everybody has free human rights and it's an open system and it's kind of like a meritocracy. Everyone can go to university and the people that get the best scores will get the best jobs and get the best money. It's, it's a free competition. And nobody tries to manipulate or change that. You have to let the market run. The equality of outcome, which is the communist idea, essentially is that everybody will get the same. Everybody's going to have Ibeg Manon. Everybody's going to have the same house. And when we do a an interview, we're not just going to pick the five best people or the six best people. We're going to have three men and three women. We're going to have equality of outcome in everything. So communism really tries to 
put things to equal measures. And both of them believe in publicly owned properties. Now, I mentioned, for example, that in England we have the NHS. And this is the National Health Service. It means all the hospitals are free. It's owned. Uh, taxpayers pay and, and it's run like that. You have the same in Canada and such forth. Both of these were implemented by left wing governments. Left wing is what you normally associate with socialism and communism. OK, on the economic scale, the economic scale, if you go to the left wing, which would be sort of like uh, the left parties in Korea, like the Minju Dang or Jong Yi Dang, perhaps a little bit An Chao Su is a bit more central, but they're more about these ideas. And you can see that uh, with all this money being paid to people, there are elements of this. Maybe those parties are good for this time. Socialism is, so that's what they have in common, socialism and communism. How are they different? Socialism is distribution based on contribution on production. So it will be given out to people from the state according to how much the people work. So it's still distributed to you. It's distributed from a central point, but it's distributed according to how much you how much you work and how much you do. So if you've if you've done a lot of work, you will get more in return. Socialism, one difference that it allows personal property. You can have your own clothes, your own house and such things like that. And also it allows freedom of religion. It doesn't matter who you believe or what you worship, anything like that. Communism believes in equal distribution regardless of contribution. And production is based on need, not desire or choice. So what does the country need? The country needs this. The government decides. So that's what we'll build. We don't really need uh, 20,000 iPads. What we need is more bread and more green energy, for example. So deciding what is needed and then that is distributed to every citizen exactly the same. Every citizen will get the same amount of rice this week. Here you go. Here is your rice for this week and here is your meat for this week. Doesn't matter if you're a man, a woman old or young, rich or poor, everybody gets the same thing. So in, in a theory that tries to make it equal and then it's what you do with those same things. Another thing that communism will do, however, is it will not allow too much freedom of religion. Communism is sort of an atheist approach in that it doesn't believe in God or things being determined by higher powers. It believes the state, um, the government, the central thing is the highest power. So there's not really any religions. You could then sort of look at the cult of personality. So instead of, so atheism here means no religion. So just in that sense, in case anyone's interested, you could be religious. You could be spiritual. You could be agnostic. Or you could be atheist. In a sense, these are four orders. So to be religious means, yes, I'm religious. I go to church, I go to temple, I go to the mosque. I'm part of an organized religion and I have a label or a faith. You could be spiritual. Spiritual means, well, I kind of believe in something, but I don't really like the church or the temples or I, I'm just spiritual. I believe in something beyond the physical, beyond the wood and the bones and the flesh. I believe there is something like the spirit or the soul or energies, but it's just not assigned to a certain religion. So you could be spiritual. Agnostic. The third one, agnostic, means I don't know. I have no idea. So I'm sitting in the middle. I'm sitting on the fence. If some evidence comes to me and evidence says, well, there is a God, then OK, then I believe in God. But if the evidence comes to me and says it's all made up, then I believe in that. Agnostic means you don't take a position because literally you cannot know. You cannot 
understand what is beyond that and which that's what a lot of religion is isn't it religion is based on faith and belief rather than knowledge or experience so in that sense agnosticism to be agnostic seems for many people the most sensible position and finally atheist atheist means i believe there is no god i believe there is uh, no such thing and again that can be seen just as equal to religion because you're you're having a belief and a faith in something beyond the physical or empirical world so you can see that there are two ends to be religious and atheist are at two ends of the opposite scale there and they're, they're very similar in some ways um just coming back to this idea of religion and communism because religion and money since weber Max Weber, the German sociologist, he looked at capitalism and Protestantism and sort of Calvinism as well, I should say. But what Max Weber did uh, in terms of why he said that capitalism was successful the German sociologist Max Weber said capitalism was successful not because of this, not because capitalism is magic, but because of this, because of the ideas in people's head. If capitalism existed, but there was a different culture, then maybe it wouldn't have worked at the time. Capitalism requires people to have ideas and beliefs to really push it forward. Because, for example, if your beliefs are Buddhism, and possession is suffering all life is suffering and to have things keeps you further away from um, achieving uh, moksha or escaping samsara getting to nirvana all these buddhist words if they're your beliefs and they're the beliefs of the whole country maybe capitalism's not really going to work because all the religion and the beliefs tell you the opposite the religion and the beliefs tell you that possession of things and owning things keeps you away from God so Max Weber's ideas were that maybe it's not just the system because if you went and got a wholly Buddhist country and everyone was really quite Buddhist and you put capitalism in there and then you got a very Protestant or Christian country and you put capitalism in there he believes that they would react differently why the structure the economic theory would be the same but the ideas inside people's head and how they act and their views on heaven and hell and good and bad and evil are different so therefore they would act different and therefore there would be different economic results that's what max weber came with the idea that our thoughts and our beliefs are very important communism says no religion just going on to that if you take the idea of a cult of personality it says no religion but in every school or building in north korea there is a picture of uh, kim il sung and kim jong il sort of like gods and when stalin was in charge that in the soviet union pictures of stalin everywhere um, even in the early days of north korea actually there would be pictures of stalin at the top and then Kim Il-sung underneath. So these communist regimes, they do build up cults of personality. And we know in North Korea that it says no religion in communism, but they've essentially created a religion, Kim Il-sungism, where Kim Il-sung is the god. And uh, Kim Jong-il was born on the top of a volcano when a star was shining. And they've created a religion around the, the Kim family from the Baekdu line. It's the same as the, what the Europeans did in the medieval times when we said the king is the son of God. The king has the divine right. The king gets his power from God. It's very similar to that. So it, it seems that religion or ideas and beliefs do go around everywhere. And in that sense, it may be interesting for you to consider uh, what happened in <clears throat> South Korea or how South Korean beliefs affect economic inequality or the economy in any way because they might do one very interesting thing is that most countries as they get richer 
they get less religious. So there's a negative correlation. As they get richer, then they get less religious. And so the very rich country in general, Il Banjogoro, of course there are exceptions, but in general, the richer the country, the less religious. And the poorer the country, the more religious. That's what happens over time if you look at things. And of course, what type of religion would be important if you remember Weber's idea? As South Korea got richer, as the miracle on the Han River, which was a fascinating miracle, because until 1970, let's say 1960, 19, about, 19, about the 1960s, possibly even early 1970s, North Korea was better economically than South Korea. It was doing better at that time. South Korea really hadn't taken off. It, it sort of required Park chung -hee or the, the country to do something. But at that time, it wasn't really successful. That miracle on the Han River didn't start from 1948. Didn't start with Eason Man. It, for the first 10, 15 years, perhaps longer, there was nothing. There was no real economic development. And in the North, there was a lot of economic development because North Korea was getting money from China and from the Soviet Union. Uh, it was playing two hands, whereas for South Korea, it was only sort of getting money from America and it wasn't spending that money well. There was a lot of corruption, as you probably know, a lot of authoritarian rule as well. We're, at the moment, we're in the, the weeks of the April movement from 1960, where the the Korea University students, they sort of marched on National Assembly and demanded Lee Sung man finally leave because of the corrupt elections in March 1960. So, for South Korea, as it made that big miracle on the Han River happen from about the 1970s onwards, when it had invested in the heavy infrastructure, the steel and the shipbuilding, looking at POSCO down in that uh, east corner of South Korea where Park chung developed a lot of it. Uh, and that's not to say a political opinion, that's just a fact, and he neglected the other side. Um, but in doing that, during that time when Korea started going up the world economic tables, it was very low, level with countries like Ghana, in Africa, no disrespect to Ghana, but all of a sudden, after 20, 30 years from the 70s, now it's up to number 13 in the world or 12. After COVID-19, it might be better. It might be worse. But that happened while people were getting more religious in South Korea. Christianity was everywhere. Christianity was growing. If you walk around Seoul or South Korea in general, you always find churches. I've been to some really small towns in South Korea right up by the border, right into the countryside, small towns, and there's a there's hundred people there. There's always a church. In South Korea, you can find them everywhere. Before I came to South Korea, I thought there would be loads of temples, guys with beards, smoking pipes, sitting in the mountains going, oh, that was my stereotype about what Korea would be. And when I came here, I was like, there are churches everywhere. So there's, there's always that correlation or combination of how those two work. And that's to say nothing about whether God exists or not, but whether a belief in God or what beliefs affect the development of the country. Um, a couple of interesting books. Uh, Schumpeter's book, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy, is one of the most... Uh, famous books on the subject. It's probably translated into Korean. I don't know if the translation will be good or not, but that's a really famous book on this subject. So if, if this subject interests you, if you want to know more about economics, uh, Joseph Schum uh, Schumpeter's book is really famous. That's that's a big one to read, I would suggest. Uh, Hajun Chang, Tang Hajun, he writes a lot on these kind of subjects and uh, he's quite well-respected in the international field. So he, he his books sell loads 
internationally. I'm not sure his reputation in Korea, but he is Korean and there are lots of Korean examples of his work in there. Now, just some isms here. These are kind of, these are what you call jokes or memes, but they seem to have a little bit of truth in them. So this just might help you understand a few things. Um, this is called uh, You Have Two Cows. There's a whole Wikipedia page on this. You have two cows. Eh? So do marine and there. You have two cows. In an American corporation, you have two cows. You sell one and force the other to produce the milk of four cows. Later, you hire a consultant to analyze why the cow has died. So what is it suggesting here about the American corporation? I'm not going to explain them to you. You should be able to understand. Socialism. You have two cows. You give one to your neighbor. Communism. You have two cows. The state takes both and gives you some milk. Fascism. You have two cows. The state takes both and sells you some milk. So hopefully you understand a little bit between the differences there. Now, let's do a little thought experiment. So imagine you're walking down the street. You're in Seoul, you're in Uljiro, you're in Myeongdong, you're in Busan, you're in Tonan, Daejeon, doesn't matter. You're walking down the street and you, you start talking to some random South Korean people. And you ask them, hey, what do you think is better, capitalism or communism? What do you think they're going to say? Where where will their answer be? If you say, hey, uh, capitalism or communism, which is better? In general, what do you think the South Korean people would say to that question? <clears throat> Probably most people would say capitalism without thinking, but the, the answers would be different whether you were in the East or the West. And the answers would also be different if you asked a young person or an old person. <clears throat> if you asked rich people, or poor people, if you went to Gangnam, or you went to Norwon perhaps, or the countryside, you would get different answers to these questions these days. Probably still, the answers would be about, I don't know, what do you think, you're Korean? 80% would say capitalism, maybe 90% would say capitalism, and 10% would say socialism, communism. I think it depends on how many young people you ask or what region you ask, how rich they are. But generally, there would sort of be about an 80-20 ratio, maybe. Maybe down to 70-30. But imagine that you did that 20 years ago. Imagine you did that in 2000. Or imagine if you did that in 1980 or 1970 in South Korea. Hey, which one do you think is better? Well, you couldn't do that at the time. You couldn't do that during the 1970s or the 1980s or the 1960s, 50s, because maybe you would have been shot. Maybe you would have been, they would have treated you as a traitor, as a North Korean spy. They would have um, really punished you or they would have seen you, you're not patriotic, you're not Korean, you're an enemy for asking such a question. And... I say that because thought or discussion around this topic in South Korea is still really dangerous. It's it's a modern issue in which people are facing, people are dealing with, everyone's saying we need money from the government, the government has to distribute money to the people, and the question is, should we distribute the money equally? Should everyone get the same money, like Yi Jae-myung, Shi Man-won, or should it be according to how much money you have, then you get different amounts. So if you're really poor, you get Oshiman one. But if you're really rich, you get nothing. If you, a little bit, you get Ishib. The distribution of money from the state and the equality is a really big issue now. And it is being discussed and it needs to be talked about how we go on because the essential parts of Korean society are the nurses, the doctors, I'm not sure the teachers so much, but you understand that a lot of people are staying home now and society is still going. We don't really need all these other people. We need certain essentials. And that's what the society is functioning on now. But this conversation has been illegal for a long time or this conversation hasn't been there. It, it, it's been dangerous and 
That's why I'm trying to get it into you now, because these conversations suddenly in Europe, America and Europe is a bit different. In America, because of the Red Scare, because of McCarthyism and the Red Scare, you can go and check them if you want, or the fear of communism, uh, any conversations like this in America around the same time would have also been very dangerous. MacArthur... MacArthurism? 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 McCarthy... General MacArthur is the, uh, the, the general from the Korean War. MacArthurism, sorry, I believe. Get my MacArthur's wrong. I hope you understand the point that I'm trying to make on these two slides, that yes, these days, still so many people would say capitalism. And I'm not saying capitalism is wrong or socialism is good. But I'm saying nowadays, yes, it would be like that. But 20, 30, 40 years ago, the conversation just couldn't happen. So the conversation is changing. And now we're seeing state distribution of money, what should happen. So it seems relevant. It seems like a modern issue is why I'm bringing that up. <clears throat> now, let's just have a look at some of Karl Marx's ideas. Marx <clears throat> is probably one of the most powerful thinkers of the last couple of centuries. Because if you take the idea that uh, revolutions happen uh, from an idea, every revolution starts with an idea in a man's head, said Ralph Waldo Emerson. Every revolution starts as an idea in one man's head. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Those of you that follow me on Insta or Twitter will have seen that I posted that recently. Now, this is quite true because revolutions come from ideas. They start with one person has an idea, that idea spreads, let's do this, let's do this. It might be a good revolution, a bad revolution. It might be the, the 1980 Guangzhou uprising, or it might be the impeachment of ex-president Park Geun-hye in 2016-17, might be the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Arab Spring. All of these start from ideas, and the idea spreads. Now, for Karl Marx, Karl Marx had an idea. His idea came to be known as Marxism, or socialism, communism. This idea that he wrote down with Joseph Engels, and he wrote this down in London, England, spread around the world and had a huge impact. Now, I think it's safe to say that a lot of this impact uh, up till now has been pretty disastrous. If you look at the Soviet Union, how many millions of people died in Stalin's gulags, where it was 20 million, the numbers are hard, or, or Chairman Mao's China millions and millions of people dying because of this but that's definitely bad but that's a powerful idea that caused this to happen it started with an idea and therefore I, I think Marx is definitely one of the most powerful thinkers because he had this idea and it gripped people it appealed to them and remember Marx was a European writing this in London England and it affected China like that and it affected North Korea like that, and Vietnam like that, and Cuba like that. So this idea transcended culture. This idea transcended national boundaries. This idea transcended different things. That, that's, quite, that's quite rare. That's very hard to do. You can't just do that easily. So, yeah, hugely controversial figure. And lots of bad stuff. But I think to just avoid studying him is very dangerous, and that seems to have been a lot in South Korea. So try to explain some of Marx. You should always, part of enlightenment or part of mod modernity, is not trusting the book, is not trusting your teacher, is trusting yourself. You have to go and read Marx by yourself. You have to go and read the... Um, the Muslim or the Islam text. If you don't like that, go and read their books. 
Go and read your enemies. Go and study them. And don't take other people's stereotypes for granted. Go out there and read them. If you don't like... Uh, you don't like men, go and read men's books. You don't like women, go and read women's books. That's what you're meant to do. So, Marx, in his ideas, it's already getting quite long. How much am I going to get through? Both Marx's critiques of capitalism are a result of how production is the primary thing to strive for, and that ignores and dehumanizes the people that have to operate within it as workers. So, in capitalism... Production or capital is the primary thing. The goal in capitalism is what you call the bottom line or profit. That's the goal. The goal is not the moral or social economic, is not the moral or cultural or social development of the humans. That's not the goal of capitalism. The goal of capitalism is to produce more and to get more. That's the goal of it. And so for Marx, he said, well, that's not good because it causes problems with humans, dehumanizes them. And the working class is the exploited class. They're exploited in terms of their physical production, their quality of life. We'll come to it a bit more but uh, those that do all the production are the masses are the workers and the people at the top who don't do any production they own the means they own the factory they own the company they don't have to work every day but all the profit that comes in goes up to them that's Marx's idea well that's what Marx saw with capitalism it wasn't an equal thing where everybody is working as hard as they can and everyone's going up like this getting their own profits what Marx saw was that their own profits go to the people at the top that was one of Marx's uh, theories and the reason this might be interesting or important for you is because when we talk about alienation and Marx last week you had to look at suicide you have to wonder how much this plays a role in it. Excuse me. <coughs> so consider your job. If you have a job, if you have a part-time job in Alba, if your mum has a job or your dad has a job, I have a job. Marx believe capitalism at its core was simply getting someone to do something for one price and then selling it to somebody else for a much higher price. While you at the bottom are working hard, producing more than you get in your paycheck each week, a handful of people at the top of the business are getting way more than they produce. So let's take this as an example. First, let's use a coffee shop. So this place sells coffee. And the owner is a guy called Mr. Kim. And Mr. Kim sells his coffee for Otanon. So what Mr. Kim does is he gets, he needs to hire someone. He needs someone to work in his store. So he hires, he hires Juhi. And each coffee is 5,000 won. That's how much the coffee is worth. So when all the customers come in, one coffee, 5,000 won. So Juhi makes the coffee. Mr. Kim sits in his office now mr kim says to juhi every coffee you make or your wage i'll give you ichonon and so juhi gets ichonon and mr kim gets samchonon so mr kim as it says here instead of him working he's getting someone else to do it for him doing the work and then selling it to the other people for a higher price. You do the work for 2,000 won and then I sell it to them for 5,000 won so I take 3,000 won and I did nothing. This is how Marx views capitalism. So somebody else takes the money from your work. You work, somebody else profits from 
your work. If you want to be really controversial, you could look at that in terms of, say, Sol Yode. Now, Sol Yode is one of my jobs. Sol Yode pays me money. Now, you also pay Sol Yode money. You pay money for your tuition. I'm not sure how much it is these days. It's Haveg Manon or Veg Manon for each semester. Now, if I've got at Sol Yode each semester, what, 200 odd students? I don't get the money from the tuition that comes in. Soliode takes your money and gives me a little bit like that. You see how that works? And I'm not complaining about my job here. I'm trying to use the coffee shop example in a different field. That somebody will take your work and sell it to somebody else for money to make a profit. That's Marxism. Or that's how Marx believes capitalism works. This might be good because Juhi gets each on one and Mr. Kim gets Samch on one and the customer gets a coffee. So everybody should be happy, really. However, Marx is saying what one of Marx's things will come on to this division of labor in a little minute. Actually, we should do. But Marx believes that there are systems inside capitalism. I've said this already. That's going to eat itself. That this system, what I just showed with the coffee and Juhi and Mr. Kim, if you keep running everybody through that over a long period of time, Marx believed that there's an internal conflict inside that system that will make it fall apart. So the feudal system caused, had conflict inside that led to revolution. And slavery, when we use slavery, eventually that broke down. He believed the same thing was going to happen to capitalism. Yes, it's good in the short term, but over the long term, it's going to break down, according to him. So for for Marx, one of the key points was that once capitalism is finished, socialism will replace it. Again, that was his idea. Check this. This is important. Once the industrial world has been developed, once the world has been finished and we have the computers, the technology and everything done. He didn't know about computers, but once the industrial revolution had been completed, once we had mastered the means of production and all the factories to work for us, then he believed people wouldn't need to work. And then socialism would come in. That's not to say socialism is a good thing or a bad thing. Of course, Marx thinks it would be a good thing. I think so. But that's how Marx saw it. So Marx didn't see uh, socialism replacing capitalism. Marx didn't see socialism and capitalism fighting with each other. He saw once capitalism was gone, then socialism comes. So they're not there at the same time. It's, it's, it's a revolution in the system, for him at least. You go from the feudal system, and that feudal system eventually goes. Just like the Joseon dynasty eventually went down. The, the Yangban and the, the Jungin, the Nobis, the system eventually went down and it was replaced by something else. And he believes that will go down and be replaced by something else. So they're not at the same time for Marx. Um, so, two opposing thoughts here. Of course, we just covered this a little bit. One of the internal conflicts of capitalism. So this is kind of the language that you need to try to understand an internal conflict. It's a conflict inside capitalism. It's a problem with capitalism itself. It's not a perfect theory. It's not a problem with <clears throat> human nature. But it's a problem with the theory itself. Like if you imagine a computer code, that this computer code has a problem inside. And if you run the code for a long time, eventually it will crash. Not straight away, but there's a problem in the code that will crash it. That's what he is kind of saying about capitalism. One is, and this is a term that you'll hear a lot, is that the capitalists control the means of production. And by the capitalists controlling the means of production, you could probably think of them as the chebol or the conglomerates in English. And 
they're always trying to earn more money and they own the companies they own the means of production so the production of smartphones is owned by one person and the production of hyundai cars is owned by people certain people certain families in korea and in korea it's interesting because the chebol a bit like zaibatsu in japan but different they're owned by families that hand down the power if you see when in apple when steve job dies he doesn't give it to his son or or his family then you get tim cook someone else comes in so the corporation is not just the family in south korea the corporation and the family are tied together and that makes it really serious here also makes it a little bit like north korea the chebols and the conglomerates you could think of north korea as running one big chebol in a sense or you could think of samsung as running one big north korea here where the power just stays centralized and they distribute so the capitalist makes things more efficient yes introduces technology yes lays people off and has less employees do the same work that more employees used to do so as it gets more efficient as technology comes we don't need as many people we used to need 10 people to do this work but now we just need sort of six so we'll get those six people out and those six people they'll do the work of 10 people or they'll do the work but their wages will not go up and so everything's going up production is going up but people's wages are kind of staying the same now most wages in our field in my sort of broad academic field the wages have generally been the same since I've been here since 2005 and of course I've worked in a couple of different academic jobs and the position at Soliode as a Jogyosu is a little bit different from the position at Hanyang De would be different from somebody working just as a as a Wano Sun Sengnim or a Hagwon and ding 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 but in those different areas those wages have stayed the same from 2005 to 2020 essentially they've stagnated stagnation is a bad thing now in that time the price of things so the wages have stayed the same uh, let's put it over here so during stagnant wages stagnant but what has risen rent beer food petrol gimbap you know the price of gimbap is a is a good thing in 2005 when i first arrived gimbap was sort of tonon sometimes tonobekon gimbap was and the the chamchi gimbap was ichonon it was the chamchi was the expensive one now chamchi gimbap can sometimes be sort of four five hundred you go to gimgane or places like that i know it's different but a gimbap chonggu called gimgane Kim in 2005 you pay about 1500 now you pay this cigarettes used to be sort of chonobegon ichonwon now sachonobegon mekjudo rent is really much more expensive rent you could you used to have a decent place now rent is really expensive so these are the problems and the problems are this is what is said by marx it's not because people are bad it's not because capitalists are bad it's not what marx is saying it's because they value capital they value profits they value money and they have to value money because that's the system they're the rules of the game the code as it were and if you don't value capital you will lose and if you don't value what well, that's what people believe if you don't value capital you will lose so you're always trying to make sure you profit make sure you don't lose money and to do that you have to treat people in not a correct way and says when you pay less money capitalism begins to cannibalize itself it eats itself and it says the rich will always get richer and the poor will get poorer in a capitalist system so that over time as time goes the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer and that will just continue 
unless the state comes in and says we need to take some of your money and give it to other people so you need this redistribution of wealth now how do you do that how do you have a redistribution of wealth how do you ask a rich family in gangnam to say hey you got loads of money this family over here in tolwon in the shigol they've got no money i want some of your money to go to them i said no i what the gangnam family would say no i i worked hard for my money what are you talking about they they're just lazy our, our, this is our talent how do you over time as inequality grows which is what people would might say with capitalism how do you stop that you need a government to come in and say we have to do it by force that's a bit dangerous because if you say by force people are going to be angry if you do it by tax by segum if you say right all the rich people you need to give us money it's kind of what they do in scandinavia in some countries the tax is more than uh, 50% so for example if you're a really and the tax is progressive so the poor people they get tax 10% but the rich people get tax let's say 60% so if a rich person let's say owns 100 they only get to keep 40 and they have to pay 60 that's an extreme progressive tax but that would be one way to distribute the wealth <clears throat> but if that person here I'm talking about progressive tax <clears throat> where the the temp, the poor people down here I don't need, like to use poor but I'm going to do it so you understand they might pay 10% tax and the middle these people might pay 30% tax and the very rich might pay 60% tax now you can see these very rich people if they have to give more than they earn so they earn 100 and 60% 60% goes to the government and 40% goes to them they're going to be very angry because these people when they earn 100 only 10% goes to the government and 90% goes to them so it's is that fair is that the way to do it because the very rich would look at the poor people and say you get to keep all your money and i have to pay all the tax for you why am i paying tax for you and then you might get some people that don't work which become the unemployed and they just get benefits from the state so they would just pay no tax and receive money from these 60 people down here you would then find that the very rich decide to go abroad and they would not live in that country anymore or they would keep their money in swiss bank accounts or or different or macau or things like that so it's very hard to put forward a redistribution of wealth because people don't like to lose their wealth and you can see that for bernie sanders uh, who didn't win the democratic nomination it's hard to believe that any rich people would vote for him because you're asking rich people to give up their money to pay for poor people and that's not really something that many people are going to do yes there are some nice people and they'll say i'll do this and i'll give up some of my money sometimes when you see sort of billionaires like mark zuckerberg or something say they'll give a couple of million to charity sometimes that's less than a poor person giving oman one to charity because of how much they earn so this is a very big problem the redistribution of wealth and progressive taxes how do we go about doing that and you have to worry sometimes with socialists let me do this on a new page so this is progressive tax and redistribution of wealth we're talking about um there are two types of socialists it can be said this is a generalization uh but in my life i've met people like this two types of socialists the first one loves the poor and the second one hates the rich and they're very very different because you take the first type loves the poor maybe love is the wrong word but they care for the poor people they have a genuine emotion about helping the poor i think george orwell is a very good example of this because um george orwell had great empathy for 
the poor. He, he spent time living as a homeless person, as a beggar in Paris and London. He wrote about it in a book called Down and Out in Paris and London. It was about 1938. And he was very much interested in the way the poor live and their lives and how they could be better. He, that was part of it. And that's a type of socialism that you, you care for those people. Another type of socialist you'll find is someone that just hates the rich, who thinks the rich people are evil, who thinks the rich people should essentially be shot or, or got rid of or, you know, you get them out the way. And, and why is that? A lot of that comes from jealousy, frustration or anger. So you can get people coming at this conversation from two very different points. And it's important, I think, to identify what type of person that is. You know, if you're dealing with socialists or people that advocate more egalitarian communist socialist views is it because they love the poor is it because they hate the rich they're very different and if there was a society or a government or a state built on number one and there was a society or state built on number two you can see that they would be really different that's what you're trying to uh, understand Uh, what should we do here? Now we become saddled with debt. So this is a this is a very you know personal and private story for many of you. It would be very hard for to consider this because it, now it starts to affect your real life or perhaps or maybe your parents' lives. But as Marx would see it, when global trade started around this time when the, the world become globalized so we have this neoliberalism all countries and cultures are the same let's trade all around the world and do this and there's a lot to be said from that but the people in india or taiwan or china their wages will be much less than someone in london so mr kim's coffee has an office in London. Now, London is a very expensive city. And so the people that do all these websites and accounts and managing and phone calls in London, the big city, the employees there, they need a um, hundred a year. Let's just say a hundred carats a year. That's what they need. But If it were to be in, let's say, New Delhi, they would only require 20. So Mr. Kim is, of course, he's going to say, well, you do the job. That's much cheaper because the bottom line for me is not, for Mr. Kim, it's not that people in London have jobs or people in London feel good. He doesn't care about that and he shouldn't care about that. Unless he's really patriotic, perhaps, yes. And you see some of that in the... Uh, the current Hanil Gwange or the the sort of trade war in that would South Koreans neglect or not buy Japanese products even if it made their country worse or maybe they would because they really hate Japan but that's a really difficult thing to consider now Mr. Kim if he's a good capitalist and if, if Koreas were good capitalists yeah, that's how you go he would send everybody to New Delhi and he would make them work there for much less and he would have, he would get that extra 80. The extra 80 doesn't go there or there. The extra 80 goes back to Mr. Kim. So he gets richer and the people here get poorer and they get richer for a little bit, but eventually they'll stay because they're only earning 20, which is not much to his 80. So there's that growing gap between inequality and when this happens, um, if you have sort of Marxist ideas, then you'll say the people here, because they can't get the jobs, they can't get the money, everything's going to the capitalists. Then you have this big saddle of debt for education. If you want to start life, just to start life, if you want to go to school, go to university, buy a house, have a car, and that's just to start a life, okay? So if you want school uni house and a car 
They're kind of things that you need to live a life in this society. You can't go without them. But how can you do those things? How, how can you get those without either rich parents or lots of debt? You need to sort of say, well, yeah, OK, I'll go into debt and then I'll pay it off for the rest of my life. So for the next 20 years or something, I'll I'll go through these. And so the rich people don't have to do this. And so they don't have debt. The poorer people, they need to do this. And so they do have debt. And again, the inequality grows. Let's leave this. Uh, and you can screenshot it or look at it yourself. But this is the idea of private land and private property and who owns the land, because land used to be common. If you look at the work of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who did the, uh, the social contract, he would say that problems arise when people start saying this here is my land. That's the, the change from the feudal system to capitalism because of time. I'm going to leave this. Let's have a look at this one idea, because this is really important, which is Adam Smith's deliver, uh, division of labor. So Adam Smith writes The Wealth of Nations. That's also one of the books or one of the ideas that changes the world. Of course, you get Adam Smith with this idea of the invisible hand. Everybody does works for their own selfish benefit, but everybody rises. Everybody prospers because of this. Now, if we take this view, uh, Adam Smith's division of labor and the sort of Marx, Karl Marx view, in a society, if one person makes one clock and one person makes that clock and it takes them 10 hours, but they make the whole clock, they make the springs and the cogs and the wheels. And it's a it's a very nice looking clock. It sits on your. Two, three, five, six, etc. And it sits there and it's very nice. And, and they look at the clock and after their work, they've been working all day. They think, well, that's a nice clock. I feel proud to have made that clock. And maybe someone will buy that clock and that clock will sit in somebody's house. And that, that house will use that clock for 10 years, 20 years, even two, three generations. That clock will be there. And the clockmaker will feel proud. The clockmaker will feel like he made a whole something and contributed it to society. There will be a sense of fulfillment or joy in his life. And this was very important to Marx because to work and to not be alienated or to have, you know, bad feelings, you need to feel this, this psychological aspect of what the economic structure makes us feel like. But Adam Smith said, <clears throat> if we have a division of labor, so instead of one person making the whole clock, what we'll have is one person makes the round thing and one person makes the cogs and one person makes the uh, the hands that are going to be put on. One person makes the springs and you, you go like that. And so all this person does all day for the same 10 hours is <coughs> excuse me. All this person does is just make springs all day, 10 hours. But if he makes springs all day for 10 hours and they all do that, then these 10 people can make a thousand clocks. Now that's an exponential jump. That's not one person, one clock, 10 people, 10 clocks. That's 10 people, a thousand clocks. That's much better. And what do you get then? You get lots of clocks. That's great. But these people in their jobs, they're not going to be satisfied. They're not going to be fulfilled. What's going to happen is if this guy goes around and he sees his clock in someone's house or in a restaurant, he'll say, yeah, I made that. I'm contributing. If this guy goes to the same restaurant and he sees the clock or the same house, he's not going to think I put a spring in that because that's not really that big an achievement. So. Adam Smith's division of labor is fantastic and speci specialization, you know, also look at the Ricardo principles, is great for efficiency, is great for production. But in terms of the human aspect and the psychological thing, you can see that each person does the same or does their one job. And that for Marx was a psychological problem for people. So it causes what we know as alienation. 
alienation. Here's somebody making bread, not making a clock, but making a bread. And they make all the bread. People love my bread. I share my talent, so I feel fulfilled. They can see the results of their work. Now, I'm quite lucky, I guess, in academia because it's harder online. But when I'm with my students, if I have the same student, it happens quite a lot. In the first year, second year, third year, fourth year, they follow me from different lectures. Then sometimes I can see them develop and I can I can help them. I, I give them advice. I counsel them, do sangdams, help them go to uh, exchange programs, sometimes help them get jobs. I've sometimes been to students' weddings now because they're getting... They've known me a long time. I, I feel some kind of achievement because in my job, at least, I feel like I can see some of my help and my work with those students. It's coming off and it makes me feel very proud. But if you're doing a different job and you're just in a factory or just typing numbers, it's hard to feel that. And when you have this specialized society, a specialized society to make as much as we can, then you create alienation. Alienation, this feeling that you're disconnected. Problem with capitalism. It's a, an internal conflict. Remember that idea that Marx was talking about as an internal conflict. Also, we become expendable. This is a, a version of Pink Floyd's The Wall. Normally, I show this uh, another brick in the wall. Normally, I show this in, in class um, because I grew up in the 80s and this was famous in the 70s. Songs about this in England, huge pop songs. Some of the biggest bands would do songs like this, that you're expendable, that you can just be replaced because if you're just doing the springs that's not a hard skill so you go out and get someone else in so you always feel vulnerable you always feel that you can you're not needed that makes you feel depressed go and go and look at pink floyd's another brick in the wall there's kind of a uh, a musical cartoon it looks very old 1970s odd i think but look at the message in it another brick in the wall is it called part three or something <clears throat> So, we now produce so much. We produce more than we need. We have more cars than we have people. All those cars sitting there. We have empty houses. We have so many houses. We still have homeless people, but the homeless people can't afford to live in there. We have hungry people and starving people, but the supermarkets are filled. We have produced so much. And that's a great thing about capitalism because no other economic system has been able to do that. We have more, the capitalist systems has more than the other one. So that's a great thing, right? But if we have all this stuff, why is unemployment bad? If there's enough food being made, there's enough cars, there's enough houses, if we have all this to make it, why, if you're not needed, why can't you just sit around and read books and listen to music and paint and draw? Why is that a bad thing? Why do we have to work? Why do we have to be part of it? Why can't we just relax? Okay, every we've got all the technology, all the machines are done, all the food is being produced, well done, congratulations, so I don't need to do anything. Okay, I'll sit here. I'll read my book, I'll watch some Netflix, great. If we need to do anything, I'll do it. But other than that, great. Why is that bad? Why is unemployment a bad thing? It's a very controversial question, but try to think about it. Of course. So, um, some. I need to show both sides because I'm not trying to convince you to be socialist or communist or capitalist. I'm just trying to take you through a discussion to make you think and spark ideas and sometimes I always go for the opposite ideas because you've never heard them before. And when you get bigger and grow up in society, you need to be ready to handle different ideas. You need to be prepared because if it's the first time you've heard them, it's hard to consider them. So you need to start understanding two sides to everything because that makes you a more powerful thinker. Um, 
all these things that Mark said might be really nice, but when you put it into practice, it doesn't work. Look at Stalin, look at Mao, look at the millions, the tens of millions, tens of millions, it's a big number. Look at how many people died in the Soviet Union and uh, Mao's China. The numbers are off the scale, more than World War II. And so while the theory might sound great, if you try to do it, it just doesn't work. There's something in it that doesn't work. That's one argument. Human nature. It doesn't work because human nature, because people are lazy. So if we take away the incentive of money, if we take away money as an incentive, people won't work. We need the carrot and the stick to drive people. Work, you monkeys. Work, you donkeys. Without that, people won't do anything. So people are lazy, One, some people might say. So it doesn't work. Karl Marx missed that. Also, some jobs, even if you have carrots and sticks and whips, nobody really wants to clean toilets. Nobody wants to wash the sewers or unblock all the poo and stuff in there. Nobody really wants to do that. So you have to pay them. Otherwise, nobody will do it. So we need money to incentivize people. Who's going to clean the toilets in a socialist utopia? Because someone has to do it. Unless we build a robot. I'm going to kind of look into stopping here because I've gone too long. Uh, I've, I've talked a lot about sort of socialism and things like that for you. Please try to understand social mobility. So if you choose this topic, if you're doing something on social inequality or things like that, Try to get a little bit of understanding of social mobility and social mobility can happen in one generation or across generations. Now, in South Korea, I'm just going to do these bits quickly. In South Korea, the idea was that social mobility was possible, that sometimes parents would sacrifice their lives because they believed their children could climb up. If the parents didn't spend much and ate rice and kimchi, sent their child to university, then the child if they went to university, would get a job, and that would be yes. But now, if you go to university, that doesn't quite work. That's not enough sometimes, because everybody's going to university. There needs to be a, uh, a change in that mindset, perhaps. So social mobility in one generation, in your lifetime, in somebody's life, is it possible to go from lower class to upper class, or social mobility over generations, is it possible? That's a big problem in South Korea at the moment. And this was the um, the article that I've encouraged you to read on it. It's not a difficult one, and because you know the topics, it should be okay. But the article says that this, and Hedin Kim, you can agree or disagree, please. Um, 2017, the Journal of Asian Studies. So it's not a blog. It's a peer-reviewed academic journal. Still, you can disagree, absolutely, okay. that the loss of social mobility based on family ties was some of the reasons to the President Park Geun-hye impeachment and scandal. People were angry because of income inequality and social mobility. They were angry because things were changing. In the past, it wasn't that in unequal, but it was going on. And so wealth inequality has soared and younger Koreans are struggling without chances for advancement. That's the argument. And that's the anger, the alienation that the article points to. Um, the Golden Spoon and things like that you can look into. Um, barriers to advancement. In Hedging Kim makes this thing that job seekers are meant to give family background. Is that fair? Gives more privilege. <clears throat> Degrees from good universities, from Sky Universities, means better jobs. But you can only get into Sky Universities if you have all the Hagwon training and all things like that. And also with... With those people getting in there and Choguk's daughter um, getting in there not through fair means. Again, that caused a big problem. It's very interesting, the Choguk, Chesun Shil. There's sort of a lot of similarities, not exactly but with their children to show that that doesn't always just it's not always just one political side it might be an elite side rather than a bosu jimbo dang 
Um, that's kind of it. I could have spent more time. I rushed through the end because this lecture is already quite long and you'll fall asleep. So wake up. For your uh, team project, I hope you've started. I hope you're looking at something. Um, something from week five and or six. There are two weeks of materials. So you need to work out what you're going to do. You do that or that or that or everything. It doesn't matter. But it's something from week five and or six. Not week four, not week seven. It's, it's something from in there. Um, please start. If you're having any problems contacting your team members, if one person's not going, just tell me. And at the end, we'll make it so that anybody that didn't work doesn't get any points because it should be fair. We'll try to do that. I'll stop here. Let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, good luck with your work. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and goodbye.